I'm sure he's watching very closely. Yeah. Um, the last couple of weeks, hasn't we haven't sort of interacted much. Um, obviously, leading into game one, I wanted to interact with him as much as I could. You know, we, you would have saw the video that he sent through for our team meeting. You know, he mm-hmm. came to Bangalore. Um, you know, it was great to catch up with him there. Um, but it's a, it's, a, it's a difficult one for me as well because I, would, I want to keep talking to him all the time. But deep down, I know the more I keep talking to him, the more he's going to miss being here. And where he's at right now with his, you know, his, his own recovery and his rehab, and that seems to be going really well from what I've seen over the last couple of weeks, actually to the point where I feel like sending him a message and just saying, mate, just slow down a bit, will you? Like, don't, <laughs> don't rush this too much. Right. Yeah, so it's whether, you, it's whether, you know, for me, it's whether I keep really trying to include him that much or... or and that might have an effect on him missing it even more or if we just let him go a little bit. But Mm -hmm. I know all the boys have been in contact with him, I'm I'm sure. Hello and welcome to yet another episode of the Delhi Capitals podcast. It is season three of our podcast. We hope you've enjoyed our episode so far. On the podcast today, very, very special guest, the number one man in some sense in the Delhi Capitals team, Ricky Ponting. Thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. (laughs) Okay, I want to start by asking something. A few years back, when podcasts weren't so much a thing, I remember you told us that the one pre-game ritual you've got is to go in for a clean shave the night before the match. And you went on to elaborate that if your lovely wife, Rihanna, were to spot you on TV with a stubble, (laughs) you'd get into trouble. Cut to 2nd of May, 2023, that changed. What happened? And she's here. And I got away with it. That's the the miracle. Um, No, you're right. I mean, you've you've known me for a long time. You've seen and obviously heard me talk about one of my discipline type things that I'll do before every game is have a shave. So I normally will get up and have breakfast, go to the gym, get my running done, clear my mind about, you know, the day's play, go back to the room, start getting myself organised with my my notes and getting ready for the meeting and then normally have a, a shave and go down to the team meeting. But that hadn't been working that well for us this year. So I thought <laughs> I'm going to ch- I'm changing that up. I'm going to yeah. change that up slightly and, and not have a shave on game day. Although it was only a couple of days between games. So it was it was only very light stubble um, when we were in Ahmedabad. Um but I said to Rihanna that day, I said, look, I'm changing things up. We need a bit of a change of luck. Uh, I'm not going to have a shave now until we lose our next game. So th- thankfully, they're leaving in a couple of days. <laughs> they're, they're leaving on Sunday night, I think. So okay. if we happen to win uh, our next game, um, it can stay on and she'll be far enough away from me that she won't be able to physically get involved and get the razor out and shave it off uh, herself. <laughs> so <laughs> we'll see how we go. It's It's been a tough season, Ricky, to say the very least. And I absolutely cannot imagine uh, the amount of pressure that's on you as the head coach of of this team how have you been it's been a season slightly different from the last two or three that we've had yeah it has no doubt about it um you know we've had our setbacks obviously you know Rishab's accident is a you know is a, a huge setback for any team any franchise you know being our captain and our star player and and really the the heart uh, heart and soul of the Delhi Capitals you know to have him not around has been a, a really big hole left in our in our team and it even goes back to you know I think Rishab's accident happened a week or a week and a half after the auction so mm-hmm. all of our planning and everything had been done around having Rishab as part of the group and he's not there so everything that happens at the auction is sort of you know magnified to a certain degree I guess um, you know and like most IPLs teams do we were juggling with overseas player availability at the start as well we know Norky wasn't here at the start and you know Mitch Marsh played his first couple of games and then went home and got married and mm-hmm. you say so you're, you're, you're tossing and turning and changing your, your team up all the time and then when you're not winning you're obviously looking for reasons why and what little things can we do um, with our lineup to make it stronger to make it better do we need to strengthen our batting you know do we need to strengthen our bowling what's the right balance for us and um, we haven't quite been able to find I think the balance has been fine and our approach mm. to our play has been fine. We just haven't been able to, able to execute anywhere near well enough, particularly on the batting side of things. Our bowling pretty much right through the season has been um, has been very good. In the last few games it's been exceptional, which is, I think, the main reason we've won the three of our, out of our last four games. And like you've heard me say before, you know, when, you're, when you're a player and things are not going so well on the field, you know you can always change it as a player, but as a coach and you're sitting back and watching the game unfold, knowing there's nothing you can do about yeah. it, that makes it a little bit more frustrating as well. Like you mentioned, there's there's only that much of talking you can do and sitting in the dugout. Of course, there are other strategic timeouts, but uh, have there been times or an occasion where you've been frustrated and you're like, I want to glove up, I want to pad up, can I just go out there and back myself? <laughs> what I 
Saurav and myself at different times have probably all said the same thing. <laughs> okay. It's about time we got back into the nets. And no, like, no, we that's we haven't we haven't said that. We might have joked about it, but um, you know. And if you look at our batting, a lot of the issues we've had have all happened in a matter of a couple of overs, and right. all, this all happened really quickly. So sitting there, you know that there's just nothing you can do about it. For coaching coaching can be frustrating, but it can also be very rewarding as well. If we keep put, putting in the hard work, and I keep saying it, the players. You know, if you keep putting in the hard work, then this run of what seems like bad luck will change. When when you're talking to the boys uh, and, and you always tell them that, you know, your door is always open. They can always come in for a cup of coffee, a chat, whether it's about cricket or beyond cricket. Uh, you're always there um, to, to speak with them. And then often there have been times this season where, you know, in the dressing room, you've also said that, uh, is there too much of talk? You know, like, should I not not be talking? We can all take a break and then get get back together. Is that is that a little bit of self doubt? Even someone like you, you know, self doubt a little bit creeping in because of the lack of success. And I, I want to say lack of success because you always also say that there are no losses. It's either a win or a lot of learnings. Is is that a little bit of self doubt that creeps in even into you at times? No, it's not self doubt. It's just making sure that I'm doing what the players want, mm. you know. And that's what I'm. That's what I'm all about. I'm all about being the coach that the players want me to be as well. I mean, I I, I know what success looks like around a team. I've got a good idea of what yeah. my best way to coach is, and 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 certainly with our coaching group, what their best way of coaching is. But if that's not working, then sometimes you have to just be honest with the boys and say, look, is is am I doing the right thing or not? And I want okay. their I want their feedback because mm. if if what I'm doing to that particular group is not right at the time, yeah. then I need to know, I want to know from the from the boys and, and you know, speak up. If you, if you play one game or if you played 100 games, just let me know because at the end of the day, I'm here to try and make each one of you guys better and if what I'm doing is not making you better, then I'm, I'm, I'm willing to change that. I'm, I'm always willing to try and mould myself into what the boys need, what the team needs and what the franchise needs because I know that I'm not going to be right all the time, you know, but... I've been around some successful teams and we've had some good times here over the last five years, but I know I'm not always going to be right. And I'm the first one to put my hand up and, yeah. and take some feedback if the, if the boys have got it for me. Uh, have, you, have you also been getting feedback and been in touch with Rishabh? I know he was at the Nets uh, when we were in Bangalore, but has he, has he also been involved staying tuned with what's happening with the team, keeping an eye on the action? I'm sure he's watching very closely. Yeah. Um, the last couple of weeks, hasn't we haven't sort of interacted much. Um, Obviously, leading into game one, I wanted to interact with him as much as I could. You know, we, you would have saw the video that he sent through for our team meeting. You know, he came to Bangalore. Um, you know, it was great to catch up with him there. Um, but it's a, it's, a, it's a difficult one for me as well because I, would, I want to keep talking to him all the time. But deep down, I know the more I keep talking to him, the more he's going to miss being here. And where he's at right now with his, you know, his, his own recovery and his rehab, and that seems to be going really well from what I've seen over the last couple of weeks, actually to the point where I feel like sending him a message and just saying, mate, just slow down a bit, will you? Like, don't, don't rush this too much. Right. Yeah, so it's whether, you, it's whether, you know, for me, it's whether I keep really trying to include him that much or, or and that might have an effect on him missing it even more or if we just let him go a little bit. But mm -hmm. I'm, I know all the boys have been in contact with him, I'm, I'm sure. Um, yeah. Yeah, so that you know, it's been a difficult time for him. You know, I, I know on the on the physical side of things with his recovery, but you know, just the mental side of it as well of of getting over such a you know horrific accident and injury, and then probably for him looking ahead of where his career might be going, might might be heading. So it's been it's been a difficult one for all of us to deal with. I think. Uh, you mentioned how the bowling has been outstanding for for the group so far in the tournament. I want to pick your brains a little bit on. This one guy who just made himself available even when he wasn't feeling physically all right, 100% in the back of the back end of the tournament and just pulls the way he does in last overs of the games. Ishan Sharma and the art of never saying no. Talk us a little bit of how impressive he's been and how there's cricket very much left in him. Yeah, I mean, Ishant and James, I mean, hopes he's done a really good job with Ishant on the physical side of things, but also mm. on the, the, the technical and tactical side of his bowling. You know, he was, what's he been with us, four of the last six years, I think, or five, five of the last seven years, maybe, something like that. Yeah, um, just one year not. With one year not, was it? Yeah. Um, and, you know, when his name came up in the auction and we and he ended up back at DC, you know, I must admit, I, I knew he hadn't played a lot of cricket, but uh, so physically he might have been a little bit behind where we needed him to be, but also knew once we got him back here and got him working and got him back into our environment that he'd be, 
he'd be up for it and he'd be one of the leaders of our attack, which is what he's been over the last, you know, the games that he's played. Um, first game he played, was it first game he played? Or no, second game he played, he wasn't physically right. He sort of battled his way through. I think he'd been on a drip the morning before that game. Um, and he could see as his overs were going on that he was starting to feel the pinch a little bit. But... He never whinged or never complained. He just got on with it and and did a great job in those games. And then, then obviously the other night, you know, it wasn't even just his last over in the the Gujarat game. It was you know he came on for his third over and picked up a wicket in his third over as well. Yeah. And then you know was left, which you know for him he's he's probably been branded as more as a new ball bowler the last few seasons. You know, bowl two maybe three overs in the power play and then one over through the middle sometimes and not, and not much at the death, but. You know, bowled two in the power play the other day, got a wicket in his third over, which broke that partnership, and then was left with 12 runs to defend in the last over and, and did it beautifully. So, um, you know, that's skill. Uh, it's, it's, it's experience, but it's also that want to be in that contest. You know, the, the person that wants to put their hand up and say, no, give me the ball, I want to bowl this last over. And you know that Ishant's never going to shy away from anything like that. So, um, no, look, we're, we're all really proud of what he's been able to do almost um, when it looked like his IPL career might have been over. You know, to get another opportunity, and then the bowl the way that he has has been very, very pleasing, and it's all and it's and it's something that a lot of the young younger guys can look at, yeah, and, exactly. and, and learn from. Which which you know, having those older, more experienced guys around that have got the work ethic like he's got can only you know um, be really infectious for a lot of the younger guys. And uh, Ishan's good friend, uh, our vice captain for the season, Akshar Patel. How good has his batting been? It's it's again been one of the highlights. Uh, for yep, us. it has. Um, you know, to the point where probably every most Indians out there on social media will be sending me messages saying you've got to bat him higher up the order and you've got to use him higher up. I've been I've been noticing a lot of those. How much social media are you checking? <laughs> oh, no, I actually don't. Well, you know what I'm like. I, I don't very much. If you look at my own page, I'm not. I don't post very often, but it's yeah. hard to stay. It's but I mean, you're an IPO. It's hard to stay away from. If you open it up at all, then there's so many different things that you can see um, and that you're made aware of. But yeah, look, he's batting. There's no doubt his batting's improved out of sight in the last couple of years. Um, you know, even not just in IPL, but you've, you've seen what he's done in international cricket as yeah. well. And he's, you know, he's become, and he'll keep becoming a very good test match batsman as well, which which is exciting for him and it's exi exciting for India because they've now got another all-rounder that they can pick, you know, in that, you know, and if Hardik ever decides to play test match cricket again, then they've got, you know, Jadeja, Aksha, um, Hardik and even someone like Ashwin that can that can hold the bat pretty well as far as their all-rounders are concerned. So, um, no, look, he's he's been great and he's, he's bowling again has been, you know, he's, he, I think his bowling's probably always a little bit underrated because he's he, there's mm. not much flash about what he does, but you look at the end of every game and... You know, there's two for 25, there's two for 30, there's one for, one for 28. And as you know, it's, it, it seems like forever I'm handing him out a Always. change rooms man Always. of the match to the I, point where the boys are just joking about it now because they yeah. just think I've got one in my pocket for him every just game. Just for him. Yeah. <laughs> every game. So, <laughs> yeah. no, look, he, he has an impact. And that was why I was so keen to keep him as one of our retained players because, it, look, one, he's a terrific person to have around the team. As you could see with the function last night, give him he doesn't say boo ever normally. Give him Good. a microphone and he's, he's the life of the party. But no, he's, he's all round talents, obviously vice captain. He's growing in stature as well. His batting's getting better. So, you know, hopefully he's a Delhi player forever. Yeah, fingers crossed. Uh, you, you brought up social media, so I'd like to touch upon that a little bit. Uh, in, in high pressure tournaments like the IPL and, and social media has become so crucial what you're putting out, what you're not putting out because everyone uh, sitting behind a mobile phone or, you know, a laptop has an opinion and they're just going to type it out. But a lot of it in some sense is outside noise, which can also affect a player or a coach, anyone in the wrong way. There's, there's a lot of the praises, but when it's not going too well, it can just be horrible and affect someone's mindset so badly. Uh, uh, is there a way then of keeping this outside noise out perhaps you know even for the players do you have a chat with them to keep it out or is it really tough in this day and age well it depends who they want to listen to if they yeah. want to listen to what i've got to say then you know i'm always be pretty clear and straightforward with the boys there's about, a curfew well <laughs> i haven't been the one that said that but maybe i should have earlier in the tournament <laughs> um, no, look. If they want, if they choose to believe and listen mm. to social media, then you know it's it's a big dark deep hole that they can find themselves in. But if yeah. they want to talk to me about cricket and where they're at and how the team's going, then I think I can be a, a lot more positive with my words than what they'll find in social media. But it's just, you know, I I can see for the younger guys how addictive it is. Um, you know, I've only been on social media for a couple of years and, you know, I, I, I'll admit I'll scroll through all the IPL stuff and the Delhi stuff, but I don't ever look at comments. I'm just looking at what, what's happening there. Yeah. I'm sure the other guys, they were diving into 
comments to see what someone out there thought of their game, and that's mm. not going to do anyone any good. But it's it's an interesting one because even before social media, I mean, there was always newspapers and news reports and things yeah. like that, and I always felt the guys that were the most worried about reading the negative comments were the ones that always went looking for them. It's oh. bizar- it's it's strange. Like it's okay. the ones that are most worried about it are the ones that you'll see on their phone all the time. So I, it's it, it must be like a such an addictive thing that they've just got to see what's out there. But yeah, yeah so it, I, I'm not going to guide them on what they should or shouldn't do. I mean, you could you could easily try and put a ban on guys looking at social media when things aren't going well. But I don't, I don't think that's going to work yeah, for anyone. Yeah. But as I said, if they if they're worried about where they're at and, and they want to hear the the real truth, then talk to the coaches and your teammates. Don't worry about what anyone else out there saying. And they do talk to the coach and the coach always speaks with them after a match. I'm referring to your dressing room speeches, which are so amazing always and so motivational. I want to ask though, when the when the going is tough and it, it's, it's equally tough and heartbreaking for you um, as the coach of this team, because you're seeing all the hard work that's going around, you need a pep talk, you need a motivational speech. Who gives that to Ricky Ponting? Oh, the other coaches. Like I, I, we we talk a lot. I mean, before, and I don't. The thing with those speeches as well, it, I don't necessarily mean them to be motivational. Yeah. A lot of the time, they're what I've seen in the game and and how we can learn from the game. Even if we've won, what I say, hopefully, there's still something there that they can learn from to get better for the next game. You know, and if we lose, then I'll point out the areas that we need to improve on and work Good. on and get better at. Uh, look, do I need? Yeah, I guess at some at some stage, you, when things aren't going well, you do need to have someone that you can talk to and and sometimes vent your frustrations or even ask to to try and learn from them as well. And that's why we've got the people that we've got around us. I mean, I've worked with Hopesy now for what's that? It's coming our sixth year, I think. Hmm. Here, yeah, yeah. I played with him a lot. Yeah, you know, obviously with Shane as well. I played with Shane a lot. We're great mates. I know um, Shane really well. Even Hadjit and Sorov. You know, I played a lot against them and have known them for a long time. I actually, played with Hadjit at at KKR back in the first IPL. So Correct. we've got some yeah, you know, got some great people around if I want to bounce things off them. Um but I'm a bit you know, I'm I'm I'll only really open up to a lot of that stuff if things are really bad. Like I, and it's just the way that I was brought up, you know, even as a, the Australian captain. Um and when you're in these leadership roles that sometimes can be a, a lonely place as well because a lot of people won't want it if things aren't going well they won't want to talk to you and won't want to try and influence the way that you're yeah. thinking. So if you're not that way inclined to go and ask questions of people and find out what they think about things which is why I like to talk to the players and open it up to them to, to because I know that more often than not they won't come and talk to me but if you if you want to open up and share then you know I'll do it but I'm, I've, I've always been one of those guys that if things are not going well just give me a little bit of time to think about it and I'll come up with what I think is the right way to fix it and change it and then I'll go away and try and implement that. Is that what it was like when you were uh, when when you you were playing as well uh, you know just me. Who would you go to if, if you'd had, let's say, a lean patch or a really bad game and you're like, you know, I know I'm going to be okay, but I just need the day off or I just need to switch off completely um, and something or someone can fix this for me. Yeah, one or two people. I was never, I, I didn't want to have too much advice or too, too much information. For me, it was about having a couple of people really close to me that I trusted and, and just would go to them. Because I think, and that's what I say to the players all the time as well. We even, look, we've got a great coaching group here, yeah. but we've got a lot. Yeah, and if you're a player and you want to go and ask every one of those guys for their feedback before you know it, you might have five or six different um, ideas and thoughts about where you're at and what you need to fix and what you need to change. And if you've got that much information, especially as a young player, it's pretty hard to deal with that. So, I, I would much I always say to the boys, look, come and talk to me first. Like, ask me, talk to me. If you don't think you're getting the right answer from me, then go somewhere else. But it's no good going around everywhere and then coming to me as the last resort. Mm. Um, and that, you know, that was. When I was a player, if things weren't going well, I had the guy that I think had was the best batting coach that I ever had, a guy called Greg Shippard, who was my first mm. state coach and is now having great success in the in the BBL as coach of the Sydney Sixers. Um, he was the one that I that I went to if uh, because I knew he was watching every game. He knew my batting technique inside out. He knew me really well. He knew how to communicate with me. And basically, as a coach, that's all I wanted. I wanted someone that I could trust, yeah. someone that knew me, and someone that knew my my technique well. And I didn't need anybody else. That 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 one person was enough. Was um, was the black diary a thing back then as well? Making your extensive notes when you were playing. It was as well? actually, yeah. Um, I'm not sure if you've read my book or any anything in my book, but I and it, I had a diary that I used every every night before I batted into in an international game. So I was in the middle of a test match and a team was seven down. Um, that night, and I knew I was going to bat the next day. Then I would lay back in bed that night when and actually write down 
the things I had a checklist of things that I, I knew that if I did well then it was giving myself the best chance of having success the next day right. and I didn't never let a day pass without writing those things down for just for mental reinforcement for myself the, the next day because you know I, I think what's between our ears our, our brain for me is like a computer that if you put the inf the right information into it then it'll hopefully give you the right information spit the right information back out tomorrow yeah. so and I didn't want when I, when I got to the ground on a day of a game I didn't want to be thinking about that stuff then I wanted to do it the night before the homework's done it's done it's in yeah. the it's in the memory bank it's locked away and then when I get to the ground I can just go out and not worry about any of it because I know it's all done I can just go out and play yeah. so you know I, it was very simple stuff that I had it was just a checklist of of little things that I would I would write down I'd make a dot point write the words down finish the 10, 10 or 12 whatever it was I'd then go back individually and and visualize what each one of those words or sentences meant and then I'd underline it once I'd underlined it, it meant that that part of it was finished yeah. I'd move the way through those I'd then get to the opposition I'd write the opposition bowlers down and how I thought they would try and get me out and then how they would try and stop me scoring. Mm. So once I had a clear, like it was James Anderson, I knew he was going to try and bowl an in and try and get me LBW and so I knew how I could set up a plan for that and then once I knew he was going to get me out, um, then I could work a game plan around that. So I'd do that with all their bowlers and then I just literally would underline that as well, close my diary up, put it next to my bed and lay back and go to sleep and that was done. It's, it's there in your book, uh, like you mentioned, but are the diaries stacked anywhere? Or you, know you what? just did away with no, them? No, no. <laughs> I should show you my suit. I've got them all here. Really? I've got every year of my coaching time at DC in with me. That's a fat stack of diaries. It's then. a fat stack of diaries. So, you know, the, the inside top of your suitcases, they're all in there. So I would, there'd be oh, maybe a dozen of them. Oh, mm. that's, that's a collection. So we can go back to 2018 and see what I was thinking then, see, if you yeah, like. Yeah, see, yeah. see if anything's changed. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, the way you played your cricket, Ricky, you... Uh, captain teams uh, and now now you go about your coaching very intense competitive attacking that's how you played your cricket as well what is Ricky Ponting beyond that tough exterior that we've always seen you can answer that for me you, you, <laughs> you, you tell me um, no what, what don't am think I? that for sure yeah um, you know I think there's been a real change in me as a person since I retired from playing mm. um, and even I think probably the last few years that I played when my family came along, it probably softens you down a little bit as a person as well. You, you, you realise that there's a bigger world out there than just you and cricket and, yeah. uh, and the daily grind of cricket. So I think that started cha to change me a little bit when Emmy and Matisse were, were born. Obviously, Fletcher wasn't born when I was, when I was playing. But um, I talk about it now as when I was, when I was playing, I, it, was almost, it was like I had my helmet on all the time. You know, I was talking that way like I was, I was guarded. Since I've finished, I've been able to take my helmet off and open up and people have got to know me and learn about me and understand me a little bit more than ever before. I mean, and when I was, as, I was, as a player, you know, I was captain most of the time that I played as well. And I was very protective of my team and the, and the players in my team. So I didn't, I, you know, doing, you would have hated me at a press conference <laughs> because you would have asked the greatest question of all time and mm. I wouldn't have given you much back mm. because I was so protective of, of, of our team and the, bo and the boys. That was my job. I, I, you know, I looked as, and same here now, I look, as, look at myself as a, as a teacher and a protector of the players, you know. And yeah, you, for and, sure as a protector. And you yeah. know, if there's something, you know, if there's a big, if we've had a bad game or if there's something in the media that needs to be dealt with, I'll say, okay, I'll, I'll do it. I'll put my hand up, I'll do it because I know that I can protect everyone better than what others might be able to and that's my job. Yeah. There's no doubt that I'm a very competitive person that, you know, I, I don't like, you know, I don't like laziness, I don't like lazy people, I don't like guys wasting their time and wasting their talent and, and not doing the what's right 100% of the time for their team because I, if, if, you, if you're not committed yourself to one day, it's not just affecting you, it's affecting everyone in the team. You know, if, you're not, if you don't train well on one day and then you have a poor game, then I'm going to look back at you and say, well, yeah, you had a poor game because you didn't train well. You had a poor game, the team lost because you had a poor game. So I, we can't afford that, yeah. you know, and that was the way I was as a person and a player. And I expect that from, from the boys because I think I've lived through, you know, enough days of cricket and games of cricket to realize that if you don't do the right thing every day then you're leaving yourself open for for failure and that means that it's not just you failing it can sometimes be the team and that as far as i'm concerned is not what being in a team's all about at the end of every training session i don't know what it's like when you're back home but at least here during the ipl um at the start and at the end of a training session uh there's always a little session for your son Fletcher. Uh, how, how's that going? He looks very impressive, but that's something, is that something that also, because you want to pass on uh, to your kid, um, you know, or is it also something that is a bit of a 
refresher for you after you're done with the main team? Well, Fletcher didn't care about cricket one bit until being in the bubble with the boys last year. He, I mean, he, he had no idea what what I'd done. He knew that I'd played, but he, he would, as, as I said, he wasn't born when yeah, I was playing. Yeah. No he's, real. He's not like seen any tapes or any he, video recordings, books or anything at all. He's seen some of that, but he's he's also very protected. He, he doesn't like me to know that he's watching me. Oh. So if he's he's forever now watching cricket on an iPad or whatever it is, mm. but if. I go to have a look at what he's looking at and it's me, then he turns it off before I get there and puts it down. But if it's not me, if it's Glenn Maxwell or someone else, then yeah. he's happy to show me what he's watching then. Um, but honestly, he his love for the game started in the bubble last year when he came into the envir- into this great environment that we've got and the family that we've created here at the Delhi Capitals. And, and I think that was heightened in the bubble last year in Mumbai. Yeah. Like everyone was there together, we were, you know, and it was, you know, you couldn't help but be bumping into someone, hanging out with someone. Correct. And he, he just felt, he felt like he was part of the squad last year. I mean, with Mitch Marsh and Timmy Seifert and those guys, yeah. he just hung out with them the yeah, whole time. Yeah, Rishab was his bestie. R- Rishab was his best. Well, it actually was to Fletcher's detriment as well because M- Mitch and Tim both got COVID and then Fletch got COVID <laughs> off them because he's <laughs> hanging around with them the whole time. That's where his love for the game really started. And yeah. He went home after that. He's played his first year of competitive cricket this season just gone and you see what he's like now like it, literally he gets the training drags his bag in yeah takes his bag on the ground puts his pads on and, and has to have a hit before the boys start that i'm not telling him to do that he yeah. just he just loves the game he has his so own much. little routine yep Th- that's some of us have to service and ishwa has already put his hand up and said that he's his personal coach as well so <laughs> it's not me it's, it's <laughs> ishwa that's ta- taking the credit for that but no look he he lo- he loves the game which is great it's it's great for me to sit back and and just watch it because as i said I, i've I love watching him play. I love watching him do it, but I've never really coached him. I've never shown him how to hold a bat, how to stand, how to do anything. He's just picked it all up from watching, and yeah. as kids do, because they're so you know perceptive with that stuff. But yeah, he'll he'll find his own way. But I, he, he's I know for he's loved being here. You know, have boys underarm a few balls to him, or you know he gets a little bit of batting done at the end. Then he waits for three hours and then goes back in at the end. Yeah. And they'll, as I said, they'll they go to the game tomorrow. They'll then fly home, and I'll guarantee you. But Emmy said to me today, she said, oh, "Dad, have you got have we got any day games coming up?" I said, yeah, well, um, our last game against Chennai. Chennai, yeah. She's oh, good, because I'll, be I'll, be I'll be able to watch that one at home, because that'll be on at 8 o'clock at home, so she'll be able to watch that. Well, the other ones are obviously starting at sort of midnight at home, so she yeah. won't be able to see them. But So that's how they, they're so invested and, and involved, and it's, it's, it's great to see. Uh, just back to the cricket, so much of the matches, uh, this, so many of the matches this time around have been very close finishes, even, even our Delhi matches, like you mentioned. They're not for the faint-hearted. Uh, whether it's us watching in the stands and uh, what is it like in the deg- dugout? Who's the one who's, I don't know, the most nervous? We catch you on television often, of course, biting your nails away. At- <laughs> any left? Any left, no. <laughs> yeah. When you're sitting there for sort of four hours chewing on your nails, there's not many left, but yeah. um, that's T20 cricket, isn't it? It, yeah. it, it? It's it's always been that way, which is what we love about it as well. I mean, we, we know that the result can hinge on one single delivery, you yeah. know, whether it's a... You know, it's a great catch, or if it's a bad decision a batsman makes, or if it's a great over that the bowlers bowl, or or whatever it might be. That's that's the beauty of the of the T Twenty game, and and one thing the players are continually learning is that how important every single ball is, and yeah. and every matchup and every tactic is so important that you can execute it well. Because if you don't, and you give up a a bad over, that can be the game gone, or. You know, if a batsman makes a, a bad mistake against a, a, a bowling matchup that's not quite matched up to him, then that's the game done. So, uh, it's high pressure. Who's who's the most uh, worked up in in that uh, dugout? Probably me. Excluding yourself, maybe. Um, or more animated. No, it'd be me. Um, well, it's funny that because it, it's probably me if we're batting, yeah, chasing, and it's probably hopes you for bowling because ah. he knows that a lot of this stuff is the stuff that he's talked about and what we've worked on as a bowling group and. You know, a lot of the batting stuff sort of comes down to, you know, Praveen and, and Saurav and I. So we, we're probably more nervous when we're batting. So yeah. if you look at our season so far, it's probably fair to say that I've been more no- nervous than Hopes he has most of the time. But um, Saurav's the other interesting one that uh, I know he has a, f- a few different superstitions and things that he does. But if things are not going well, if we start the game well, he'll start in one seat. And then before you know it, he's moved over another seat there. He'll go and stand around behind the analyst and stand there for a while if things aren't going well. And then things start to turn. Then he comes back and sits next to me again. And he'll go and get a coffee and come back. But yeah. um, I think he's he probably doesn't show it as much um, externally as what I do. But mm-hmm. I, I think he's um, he's just as nervous as most of us, I think. 
Has it been good working with him? Everyone talks about the Ponting Ganguly rivalry, but beyond all of that, I mean, what I see is a lot of respect that the two of you have for each other. What's it? Ab- absolutely. As I said, we were we were. I mean, when you talk about the rivalry, he was probably a bigger rival when Steve Waugh was captain. Steve Waugh and him had a bit Correct. more of a, you know, a bit more of, a, of edge to them what than what Sorov and I probably did. Um, but we played a lot against each other. You know, well, a captain that World Cup final against each other in '03. Um, you know, things things like that. Um, but he was involved with us back here in in '19 when things really started to, to change and when things started to turn and obviously went into a, a bigger seat for the last couple of years. Um, and now he's back with us again now. So look, we we get on really well, and the, and the reason why we do is be, because we 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 can see the bigger picture for this franchise and what what we have to do together to try and guarantee success for the franchise. And that's what it's all about, regardless of if we if we're not good mates. You know, when you're working in a team, you've got to come together and yeah. be heading in the one direction. You know, leave the past behind. That whatever's happens, happened. You know. Yeah. I guess the best example of that was when I went to Mumbai and coached there, and I'd, I'd had a, the biggest probably on on field rivalry I'd had was Harbhajan. Next minute I'm walking in the Mumbai Indians, I'm captain of of Harbhajan Singh. It's all good. And it's all good. I'm taking catches off him, and he's hugging me and all that. And then the next year I come back as coach, and I coach him. So that's I think that's a really good thing about the IPL. You know, the the international rivalries individually or team wise that you you had have probably not anywhere near as strong now because you're you're playing and working with a lot of the guys that yeah. that um yeah in the same team that you might be playing against next week. Yeah. Uh and speaking of the IPL and franchise cricket because there's so much of it now in the cricketing calendar. How how do you see it changing the landscape of cricket, you know, more than it already has? Um threatening international cricket perhaps? There's been more. T- there's been a lot of talk of that lately, hasn't there? Where, yeah. uh, especially with it sounds like some of the bigger powerhouse IPL franchises potentially making offers to international players to be aligned with them mm. for 12 months, but rather than being aligned with their with their countries, uh, that's all, that's started to a certain degree. Like someone like Trent Bolt has not accepted a New Zealand contract the last couple of years, so he's free to play more um, domestic T20 comps around the world. And I can understand it for for guys that are coming towards the end of their international career, where and they might not have. I'm not saying it's cash in, but I haven't been able to maybe exploit the bigger amounts of money that these domestic comps have been providing around the world because they've been so focused on playing international cricket. So I can see that it'll happen. Um, yeah. Hopefully not at a real detriment to test cricket because I think test cricket's got its own issues and problems that, that that it's facing right now. You know, the, the top three or four teams are fine, but I'm worried about a lot of the teams that are outside of that so it's going to be yeah the next couple of years i, I think it's inevitable it's going to probably get more to to a club based cricket will become more of a club based game i think that the guys will then go and play international cricket rather than being what it is now where they're playing more international cricket and then going play a little bit of club stuff i think it's inevitable that that will happen yeah um it is a it is a world cup here um being played in india 50 over how do you see the 50 over format is that the one that you know feels like in trouble yeah, I've I've felt that for the last oh, maybe ten years. To be honest, it's been a long time that T Twenty uh, that the more popular T Twenty cricket's become, the bigger the IPL's become. The fact that every other country's now got their own big T Twenty competition on, on, something has to give somewhere. And I've always felt that the fifty over game was the one that was going to um, suffer the most. But it's interesting as well because the, I think while there's still a World Cup, you know, it, it I think fifty over cricket probably goes quiet for a couple of years after a World Cup, but then it starts building up again building up, towards yeah. a World Cup. Uh, and I certainly know that that's how s- certain teams will structure the way that they play. Even you know, Cricket Australia, I think, are, are probably playing nowhere near as many T20 internationals this year because they'll play want to play more 50 over games to get them right, get the team right for the 50 over World Cup. Oh, okay. So um, that's the way that, that countries will try and plan it. Um, and then once the 50 over World Cup is done, then they'll have more emphasis back on T20 cricket Shot leading up, up to the T20 mm. World Cup. There's r- there's no doubt in my mind. There's room for all three of these games to survive and prosper. But let's not play them off against one another. It, it you know, it's, it doesn't make any sense to have a T twenty. Actually, the last Australian summer was a great example. T mm. twenty World Cup in Australia. Yeah. Immediately after that, Australia play England in three one day international. Immediately after the World Cup, and no one went. Yeah. Australia England one exactly. day internationals. No one went yeah. because they just been, they just seen the one of the great spectacles ever of T twenty cricket, and then you're putting fifty over cricket up against it. No. Empty if those T twenty if the T twenty World Cup wasn't there. And those three one days against England were there by themselves around Test cricket. Every one of those games would have been sold out. Yeah. So it, trying to when they're competing against each other in such a tight, close knit environment, I think that's when it's that's when it spells trouble. Any early calls though for the World Cup? 
it's in India. Oh. Last four. Last four what? Last, who's going to make the last four? Yeah. Oh, they'll probably end up saying the same teams all the time. And there's always one in there that, that trumps me a little bit. I mean, in, India will definitely be there. Um, I think Australia will definitely be there. Australia have got, interestingly enough, I mean, Australia have found it difficult to play red ball cricket in India for a long time, but their white ball record over here is really, really good. Yeah. Um, even look at the last the, the last series here immediately after the test match. I mean, they, they find a, play, a way to play really well in white ball cricket. So I'll have India, Australia... Um, I'll have England will be in there. They're, they're just they're too good. In, in their one day side is outstanding. If they're, if you know Bearstow and Archer and these guys are all fit, they'll have a, an outstanding side in the park. New Zealand and Pakistan. One of those two. One, I think one of those two teams oh, will find two. themselves in the top four. Yeah. Thank you so much for your time, Ricky. I have a quick T20 uh, rapid fire before we close yeah. this. So let's let's go. Okay. Uh, Delhi Capitals in one word. It's one word. I can use two. Okay, two. Second home. Uh, the Delhi Capitals player from the current uh, batch who has surprised you the most? Probably Ishant Sharma this season. Who's the one who asks the most questions? Aman Khan probably this year. I've had a lot of interaction with Aman this year, Yeah, which has been good. Okay. Um, a current player beyond DC uh, who reminds you a little bit of yourself? Oh, I've always said Virat when I've been asked that, but just with his passion and the way that he, he plays the game. So I'll stick, I'll stick with Virat, yeah. Nice. Uh, a current captain whose style you admire? Oh, I've always liked the way that Rohit Sharma's gone around about his business. Mm. You're talking about IPL or you're talking about international? International as well. Yeah, well, I, well, Rohit in both of those. I mean, I was the one that was sort of pushing Rohit to be captain when I stood down from the captaincy at, at Mumbai. I know him well. He's, obviously, his captaincy record in the IPL is outstanding. So I think he goes around about it in a pretty good way. Uh, which modern day cricketer plays the pull shot the best? Everyone's going to expect me to say Rohit Sharma again. Um, Which is fine. Yeah. The hitman. Stick with the hitman. <laughs> Stick with the hitman. Okay. Who plays the cover drive the best? Vera. Okay. Uh, if there's one current cricket rule that you could change, what would that be? I would go back to using only one ball in 50 over cricket. Yeah. One new ball, not two. I think it brings, it brings the bowlers back into the game more. I mean, I'm just thinking back to when I played. When I played, I don't like saying that, but the ball got old, the ball got soft, it yeah. reverse swung a little bit. So the, the fast bowlers for the last 15 overs were in the game. Now it's with two hmm. new balls. It, obviously at the end of a game, the ball is only 25 overs old. You know, so yeah. it's easier for the batsman to hit and the, it's harder for the bowlers to swing and do anything with. So Correct. I'd like to see the 50 over game played again with just one ball. Interesting. Okay. The next big thing in cricket is? Uh, well, he's already sort of made a little bit, but Rudraj Gaikwad, I reckon. Uh, okay, you've got some downtime and uh, there is no golf course around. What would you <laughs> rather do? Read a book or watch something on Netflix? Maybe? I'm not, no, not read a book. No, you got the wrong guy there. I would, I would find golf on the television and watch golf on the television. Okay. Or, 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 I'd, fi or I'd find, you know, it's, it's AFL season back in Australia. So golf and Aussie rules are my two passions outside of cricket. So yeah. um, I, I'd watch one of those. Okay. Uh, if you had to eat only one food item for the rest of your life, what would that be? Uh, one food item. I'm going to say steak. Okay. Last couple of uh, questions. What advice uh, would you give your younger self? I'm going to say what my father said to me when I was a young boy. He said, son, you're only going to get out of life what you're willing to put into it. And what's the best advice your kids give you? <laughs> oh, but they give me they give me plenty of advice. I'm not sure any of it's great just yet, but um, they do give me a bit of feedback when they see me angry in the dugouts during the games. They'd like to see me not quite so angry in the dugout, so yeah. I'm trying to mellow a little bit during the game. The kids can make it happen. <laughs> they, the kids they, they, they can trying, make it yeah. happen. Yeah. Thank you so much, Ricky, for your time. No Always worries. a pleasure and an honour speaking with you. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Thanks a lot.